It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. There we go. Uh, so I am going to, I think, focus a little bit less on technology and more on science and people in, in my talk. And that kind of befits my role as a university professor at a major public research institution in the U.S., University of Michigan. So, uh, but I'll start with a few words on exascale, then tell you a little bit about large-scale structure and, and cluster cosmology, and then finish with some comments about culture and community. Okay, so exascale. Uh, if you subscribe to various high-performance blogs, as most of us in the room probably do, and uh, there are people in this room who know a lot more about genuine exascale computing than I do, but, you know, there are there's storms brewing, potentially, for the end of Moore's Law and all that good stuff. So we know the trends that have been happening, right? We've been able to sustain Moore's Law by just putting more transistors on the chip, running them at a fixed clock speed, and hoping that we can lower the power per processor and keep it, keep it capped so we don't blow up the whole data center, right? And Bob Colwell, who is a former Intel developer, thinks about, you know, maybe 10 years more we can ride this, but it's going to end at some point because the feature scale will just get too small. Uh, to and of course, for Simon, some of you, many of you know, in the room, gave this talk earlier in the summer about not getting to exascale by 2020. And uh, you know, started with a look at what's gone on in uh, HPC over the last couple of decades. And it's been looking good, of course. Here's the top 500 performance. And uh, N equals 1 has continued to ramp up since the early 90s. Uh, but how long can we sustain that is the question. And as was mentioned, I think. Uh, by Roman in his introductory remarks, the cost of data movement, even on the chip, is going to uh, be more than the cost of a flop. Uh, at least that's the forecast for 2018. So we really have to then think about what are we going, to, how are we going to respond with our algorithms uh, in order to sort of minimize uh, data movement. We've so far been rather uh, memory and data intensive, and not so much CPU intensive. So as Roman mentioned. That's going to be a driver for us as we go move forward in terms of thinking about how we change our algorithm. And uh, he's made a 2K or $2,000 bet. I'm not sure which way it runs. Uh, but, uh, you know, here's, our, here's his reasons why we're not going to get to the exascale. And I think, you know, this is the one that we're not really, probably as an algorithm, as a community, we'll have to focus on. But, of course, there's the power wall and the cost wall and all that stuff. Still, you know, if you look at the sum of the top 500 and look at the projections, then you reach exascale of the top 500 in just a couple of years, right? 2016, the top 500 will give you exaflops. So, you know, my question is, uh, or let me remind us of basic math, an exa anything is 110 peta somethings. And it's also, if you like, this is really crazy, you know, a billion cell phones around the planet will get you to exascale too. So how about a social solution? Why don't we federate to some pseudo exascale? And that will be the closing parts of my talk. All right, now let's do some science. Uh, when we're doing dark energy studies using tracers of large scale structure in the universe, what you need to do is you need to do, go do a big deep survey. And dark energy survey is the next generation of such surveys, of which there are many more. And I'm not going to mention them all. Uh, and then you extract some statistics out of things you observe. And for dark energy survey, what we will observing is, we'll be observing is primarily galaxy locations and colors in uh, five different optical aspects. Uh, then, you know, in order to make sense of that data, you need model expectations, right? We're trying to do a likelihood analysis of some cosmological parameter space and hopefully rule that rule it out, right? And come up with a new space to, to identify uh, or add to that space parameters. Um, but you need to compute your model expectations. And sometimes that computation is easy to do, as in CMB is relatively easy. It's, it's largely linear theory and analytic. But for these uh, stru large-scale structure signatures that involve uh, nonlinear clustering, like clusters of galaxies, uh, one needs to do simulations, right? dynamical simulations, to understand the expectations for the statistics given the cosmology. But of course, since there are clusters of galaxies are indeed clusters of galaxies and hot gas, one needs also to model the astrophysical evolution of the galaxies inside those systems. So at the end of the day, when you do get your cosmological constraints, you're effectively either fixing your astrophysical model or marginalizing it. Uh, and there's two key functions that one looks for in these analysis, the expansion rate 
and also the growth of structure that tells you about gravity and whether dark energy is really just a, a, a phantom signature of, uh, uh, of non-standard gravity. So simulations that support specific surveys then uh, allow you to do the following things. You can basically make sure that the statistics you're extracting from your synthetic sky, so by, by creating synthetic skies on simulations and then processing the data from those skies, you're making sure that you're getting unbiased statistical signals. One also is then obviously predicting on, on first principles, quote unquote, the likelihood of seeing those signals given your cosmology and astrophysics, and you're doing that for potentially a variety of models. And then one, can al one also is constructing covariance matrices, and nowadays it's not, only, it's not enough to do covariance matrices, one needs to do higher order covariance of covariances and things. So it's very statistics rich, if you like. And down here, it's a little, looks better on my screen, it's gotten kind of noisy on here, it's, a, it's an image of a patch of synthetic sky, just a few arc minutes by a few arc minutes across, that comes out of our work for dark energy uh, surveys by simulations. Okay, so a quick primer on cluster cosmology. So clusters are the end tail of hierarchical structure formation. Uh, they're manifestations of multi-component massive halos in the universe. Their space density is per fairly well constrained by simulation. Basically, uh, the kind that Paul showed us earlier, large multi-gigaparsec volumes uh, capture the space density of the most massive systems that form in the universe. Uh, and but that tells us number density. In order to figure out what their observational signals are, we need to do gas dynamic simulations. Thankfully, most of the baryons in these systems don't end up in galaxies. They end up in the space that fills the galaxies in a hot phase. That emits X-rays and can distort the microwave background through some ISL Delvich scattering. Uh, and so the hot phase is fairly well understood in terms of its morphology and evolution. But of course, it's coupled to the cold phase. And we're trying to understand galaxy formation in these systems. And that's what a lot of speakers here will talk about in more detail. I'm not going to go there. Really. And that's what Paul was talking about in the very early stages. So uh, to channel my British friends, uh, wicked is a word in Britain that apparently has a technical connotation. And, and uh, galaxy formation is a wicked problem, right? <laughs> it remains a wicked problem. But one of the nice things about clusters and why these you know, blue ribbon panels continue to keep it you know, up there along with supernova, weak lensing, and VAO, baryon acoustic oscillations, clusters are still mentioned. They're messy, but they are, along with weak lensing, they give you constraints on both the expansion history and the growth of structure. So that's good. So we can test non-standard gravity with clusters. Um, the other nice thing is clusters offer, offer multiple observational probes. You can see the hot gas in x-rays. You can see it in uh, millimeter wavelengths. It's an effect on the Sonia-Isoldovich, on the CMB. It's an Sonia-Isoldovich effect. Uh, you can measure masses through lensing, and you can measure just galaxy content. Uh, and also the depth of potential well through the galaxy velocity dispersion. So you have these multiple tags that you can use to, to develop uh, a connection back to the underlying mass. And you get a lot of this stuff for free. Whenever you do a CMB survey, you get galaxy clusters for a high resolution CMB survey, you get galaxy clusters for free. Whenever you do a large scale galaxy survey, you get galaxy clusters for free. Okay? So, you know, you don't have to build a giant billion dollar, ten billion dollar project to get it come for free. And we really, I think, have laid out the key sources of systematic uncertainty in the problem. I'll say a little bit more about that in the next slide, or a slide coming up. So this is a slide from a review a couple of years ago uh, by uh, Steve Allen and Adam Anson and myself, where we just plotted up the historical development of cluster surveys and also the theoretical expectation for what you see on the full sky. So that's the magenta over here. 10 to the 15 solar masses is a coma cluster, roughly. There's a, a few thousand of them on the sky. 10 to the 14 is, is uh, more like a Virgo type cluster. Uh, there are a million on the sky. And what's nice is that, you know, for the lifetime of most of us in this room, we are going to be able to see over the next few decades a complete population of these sources on the sky. Right? Once we get them, it's like identifying the highest peaks on the planet. You know, we know where the Himalayas are. We know where the Alps are. It's nice that we're here. Uh, and once you know them, you can explore them. <laughs> and we're going to get those surveys and be universally complete in the next few decades. And DES is going to help, along with and the X-rays E Rosita. Uh, and of course, the SC surveys are, are getting incredibly, uh, really ramping up and, uh, very, very quickly and, and probably going to catch up with optical 
and x-rayed rather soon. So the next generation, this pre-exascale experiments will really start to uncover the full population of clusters out there in the sky. Uh, or I should say massive halos on the sky. Okay, and then the key systematics, I don't have, these are my wordiest slides. From soon we'll, we'll, we'll have pictures rather than words. Um, but uh, key systematics are at absolute mass scale. And here, exascale would help by not allowing us to do very detailed hydrodynamic simulations and make synthetic measurements of the, in the same way that observers do, of the mass estimation for, for those systems, and uh, really understand uh, the detailed dependencies of halo mass biases on things like formation history, viewing angle, etc. The statistical form of the mass observable relation is the other uh, systematic uncertainty. And here, exascale would help by basically being able to, uh, again, pop create large populations of massive halos from which we could understand a uh, detailed form of the intrinsic signal mass relations and their dependency on, on astrophysics. And then finally, selection effects, uh, the fact that you're looking for a megaparsec size system along a gigaparsec size sideline, 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 you know, means that you're subject to uh, signals that are coming along that sideline, not from uh, the massive halo that you're interested in. And so that blending comes, uh, we can investigate that by an exascale by doing detailed characterizations based on very large ensembles of, of synthetic spans. Of course, we're limited to four pi steradians in the real universe, but in the synthetic universe, we can do 4,000 pi steradians, right? We don't, you know, we can do multiple sides. Just to dig down into that a little bit to show you a projection, uh, here is a, on the left hand side is a uh, 100 megaparsec circle, so you're sitting on a massive halo and then doing an ATOF projection of the mass in a 100 megaparsec circle around a 5, 10, or 14 solar mass halo. This is the linear projection, here's the log. In the linear, basically what you're seeing here is most of the directions on the sky are pretty clean. But occasionally when you hit something like this, if an observer is looking at you from this angle over here, uh, you know, that goes through this dense region here, then if, you're, if you don't have redshift sensitivity, depth sensitivity at the 100 megaparsec scale, you're going to add that material into that cluster. And what that does is it changes, let's say, a Poisson, originally Poisson distribution of galaxy counts at a fixed mass and redshift into something that's distorted with a high count tail. And we just want to understand how to parameterize this and, uh, and characterize it so that we can do the right likelihoods for our cosmological analysis. And then we're doing much better for finding clusters in optical, and there's this particular method called red mapper, which is led by Eli Rykoff and Eduardo Rosso at Stanford now. And that's been applied to Sloan DRA, and I'm showing you some real data here uh, of, uh, above our richness, where our richness is basically the number of galaxies with luminosities above 0.2 L-star, L-star being the characteristic luminosity in the luminosity function of galaxies. And so there's, from this data set, DRA plus BOSS, is 25,000 clusters, uh, and uh, you reach 0.2 L-star in the magnitude limit of these surveys at about redshift of 0.35, after which you have to apply a correction factor, which is shown here as S of Z, to estimate this full richness. And here's a number density plot, which shows you that basically there's some funky wiggles in here, right, that aren't really physical. That is to say, the halo space density doesn't go up and down as a function of redshift it's going to be monotonically changing above a fixed mass threshold. And this richness threshold is supposed to be approximating a fixed mass threshold, right? But it doesn't exactly work. And so this, we need simulations to figure out why, where these wiggles are coming from. And in particular, we know that this wiggle at redshift 0.35 comes from two things. It comes from the fact that there you're reaching the uh, depth limit of the survey, but also you're reaching the, the place at which the 4,000 angstrom break for the old galaxies and clusters passes from, uh, passes filters. So that's where these features are coming from, and simulations are needed to understand those better. And then the last slide on observations, uh, that red mapper sample, you can now cross-correlate the optical properties with other known properties from other wavelengths. And this multi, full multi-wavelength understanding of clusters is something that's going to really, um, really grow. We're, we're, we're in the very earliest stages of putting X-ray, Sonia, Dovich, and optical together into a unified description of what's inside uh, a massive halo today. But we're starting to get there, and this is really the first plot. If you've been in the cluster business, most of the plots of this nature where you plot optical property against x-ray property, 
look a lot like scatter plots. They don't have a lot of structure in them. And it's never been very nice to admit that. And finally, we have a way of characterizing this rich optical richness, which now has a reasonable scaling property with, an, with a completely independent measurement of something else that measures the size of the system, in this case, a gas mass, or in this case, x-ray temperature. Uh, so, and, and, but in fact, there are outliers. And when you look at those, there's a couple of outliers here. When you look at those outliers, it turns out that this one had a poor temperature estimate because it was confused by another nearby cluster. So basically, you want to toss that guy. And this guy, it turns out, is a two-halo system. It's got, it suffers from one of those projections that I was talking about. When you look at the, if you go back and get redshifts for the system, you realize that it's really composed of two systems. And uh, Red Mapper confuses it as one and adds the optical richness. So it, really belongs back over here. Okay, so what we've been doing for DES uh, in simulation working group is supporting what's called a blind cosmology challenge. And uh, this is largely uh, work done with uh, uh, Risa Wexler at Stanford and uh, Michael Busha, who was formerly here at Zurich, um, along with some other graduate students, uh, Brandon Erickson uh, and, and others. And this part of the exercise we're doing on XSEED you know, modest calculations in terms of 2048 cube dead body simulations, but doing a number of them. And we do these on exceed resources and then pipe the data over to Stanford where we're adding galaxies, creating galaxy catalogs, uh, with Matt Becker uh, creating lens versions of the catalogs. Some of that gets piped into imaging that I showed you a few slides ago, a synthetic sky that was generated in this way. And we're going to create a border half a dozen of these over the next year uh, and hand them out to the uh, science teams and basically see whether they um, whether they get the right answer, essentially. And we thought originally that we would do hundreds of these, but we got caught up by the development of these algorithms down here, which are harder, which turned out to be harder than we thought. Okay? So we're not going to do hundreds, but in the beginning we thought we were going to do hundreds. So we thought, well, what graduate student is going to want to submit 400 jobs over the course of, you know, two or three years and monitor their development? Right? I mean, I, there probably are some of you in this room who did that, right, and who do that. But I didn't want to, you know, force my graduate student to do that. So instead, we asked for help from XSEED, got some uh, extended user support with Indiana Group, who were developing this workflow technology called Aravata. Also, XBI is the technical workflow manager, and Aravata is the larger scale kind of science gateway architecture. And here's a, a snapshot of what we're doing uh, there, essentially, we run four different cosmological volumes, and this sets up the initial conditions and then runs gadget jobs for them and all that good stuff. So the idea was to kind of create a front end, write a science gateway where we could go in and say run, and step back and wait. We get emails saying, okay, your job's done, your job's done, your job's done, and then like focus on line with the data. Right? We didn't quite get there, but I think this is the way, to me, this is what we're going to need to make uh, exascale accessible to the masses. All right, and then showing you the results of uh, now Red Mapper applied to one of our synthetic skies. Red Mapper data points are, are shown in red, uh, and then the actual halo mass cuts, uh, halo mass numbers, is a function of redshift. Uh, with different mass cuts are shown with these different uh, point styles, and you see actually Red Mapper is doing a pretty good job on these synthetic surveys of tracing about a 10 to 14 solar mass uh, mass cut, but at redshifts above 0.6, it's starting to get wonky. Um, so a challenge for the exascale error, which I'm sure will come out in, in, in the rest of the week, is to connect up these scales and, and add more physics, right? So we already know that what lives in a cluster today, when you go back to high redshift, uh, they're biased progenitors. I mean, Alex and, and company back in the 80s, the whole idea of biasing the big peaks on a large scale contain big peaks on small scale. So the first stars are likely to form in, uh, in cluster regions, in massive cluster regions. So, you know, how much of this can we capture in a single calculation? How much of this do we want to capture in a sing single simulation? What will subgrid prescriptions look like in 2023? It's interesting because when you think about what they look like today and you go back 10 years and you think about what they look like in 2003, for galaxy formation, they don't look actually all that different, <laughs> right? It was, let me form a fraction, let me, on a dynamical time, set a fraction of my gas into stars if it's above a given density threshold. That was kind of 2003. That's what we're using today. So in some ways, we haven't done much in a decade, right? Are we going to be able to do more? Anyway, Richard's shaking his head. Anyway. 
Uh, and I, I don't know what, what's generating the noise in this image because it's not on my, on my screen. Um, but uh, at any rate, I think what we'll hear, in, in, I think, from a number of speakers coming forward over the next week is the fact that we, in order to gain trust with the rest of the astrophysical community, which we know is dominated by observers, and that's where all the money is, right? Where does the money go? The money does not go to, to doing astrophysical simulations. Money goes to building hardware, shooting it into space, putting it on the ground, getting data. Analy quote unquote analyzing the data, right? So we have to demonstrate value, and the way we demonstrate value is to come forward and meet the sky. That's my, that's my view, right? Okay, so that leads me now to the end stage of my talk, which is about culture and community. I think the hero era is over. That is to say, you know, Vol Volker Springle, as a grad student, built Gadget, ran it, and developed an empire, right? You know, is that going to happen again? I don't think so. I mean, or the, it doesn't need to happen again. Um, we've let a thousand flowers bloom. I think it's time to get vertical structure, right? And maybe it's better to show this version of that picture because its tip is in the cloud. All right? Um, now, when we talk about vertical structure at the foundation is who are you and what have you done? And to me, I just, you know, I, I, I through my library, so let me also say that a, as a, at a public university, I was invited last year by the provost to chair the search committee for the next dean of libraries of the University of Michigan, and the University of Michigan is ranked fifth in the North America in terms of its library. You have Harvard's up there, Toronto's up there, uh, Illinois, uh, Michigan's up there. So Michigan has a big library, and it's a big deal. It's a $66 million annual operation, okay? And what they, what the library of Michigan is doing is they're getting into ORCID. So I'm going to get, an, well, I have an ORCID ID. I'm now an ORCID ambassador. I signed up to proselytize. So ORCID gives you an ID. It's your DOI as a scholar, right? It's your digital object identifier for you as a human, as a scholar. And I urge you to get one. And if you have your laptop open, go to ORCID ID, and sign up. Okay, and then once you do something and you create some data, put a DOI on it. We have that means, right? It's now, you know, use data science. Um, you can also put code and data in places where other people can find it. Uh, and this is the hard, this is the, this is hard, because, yeah, we have something in Michigan called Deep Blue. Guess what? They only su support five formats. So you've got to put it in, like, a PDF or a doc or text or a couple others. And guess what? HDF5 is not one of them, you know? It, Right, a doc move maybe. You know, if you make a movie, you know, like Paul's movies that he showed, they, they will probably, they'll take that. But what am I supposed to do with that in terms of science? Right, nothing. So, you know, institutions are struggling with the data tsunami. Uh, at least we have some places to put code, and then there's the public sector, which is growing, which is kind of interesting. But I don't know where that's going. And let me just show you. Go back to science for a second. One of I wrote this paper in 2008 by just reaching out to friends and saying, hey, you've got simulations. Give me just a list. Give me a halo representation that has mass in one column and velocity dispersion of the dark matter in another. I want to calibrate the halo variable relation. And by reaching out to friends and, and who had 12, you know, 12 different simulation sets using six different codes, we were able to c combine to get a calibration. But first of all, they all agreed, so you could sum them, put them together. And the intercept of this scaling relation is known to better than 1%. So that's something to shoot at, right? This has now been shot at, and it's pretty solid. So it's nice to see a percent level calibration of something with simulation. Right? And here we have some. And then, you know, how long until there's an app for this? I would really like to just have the ability to, I, I, your codes, your, your results aren't in there. Your results aren't in there. Why, why can't I get, you know, Gustavo's data and Paul's data and put it in there? Because it's hard, right? And then this is the detail on Galaxy that I'll skip that. Okay, so here's the guy we hired back, James Hilton, who was a former CIO at UMICH, former CIO at University of Virginia. Right? Chief Information Officer is now a university de de librarian dean. Right? Makes sense. Uh, and I think we should be thinking more. For people at, at living at small institutions, partnering with your library is not crazy. It's, my, it's mildly crazy, but it might actually work. Uh, and what they're doing, what he's doing, he's actually involved in this thing called Digital Preservation Network, leading this effort. And Digital Preservation Network is trying to be this, in this stack representation here. Here's things with access. Look, here's the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Wow. I didn't, you know, invite him to put that there. He put that there spontaneously. That was 
his librarian view that astrophysics is doing the right thing in terms of creating public access to common data. Right. Um, then there's preservation. DPN is going to live down here. It's going to be the dark place where you only pretty much put in and only in case of emergency break glass and get it out. And it lives with these kinds of technologies. Two slides. Actually, this is my last slide except for the thank you slide. So here's my, I mean, this is the kind of thing I want to have, convers I'd like to, love to have conversations about. Uh, uh, computer scientists love stacks <laughs> and representations like this, so I thought, oh, I can draw stacks. Let me draw a stack. All right? Uh, this is the stack that we, part of the stack we focus on a lot, and that's appropriate that we focus on this because it's important. But we can start tearing out pieces and putting physics modules in the public domain to do common things. Once we get them nailed down, there really is no reason why a Poisson solver shouldn't, you know, who, who needs to write another Poisson solver? Right? We have that. Um, and then this is, I think, where we, we need to move up the stack a little bit with our attention span. And, and, and we have analysis, and then here's a workflow layer. Finally, there should be a science portal layer. And then up on top is the hard part, because you've got to get university provosts sitting together in a room and agreeing to develop a shared infrastructure which they're barely able to agree how to create infrastructure for their own campus yet, right? So uh, and ask me about the University of Michigan's policy regarding high-performance computing, and I'll tell you about a cost recovery model, okay? Uh, so can we, you know, improve co community coordination to maximize science return at XP as we get to Exascale? And then running along this, of course, is the support of all of those technologies that I mentioned. And there's a lot of challenges to this, but... Uh, We'll see where we can get there. So thank you. Gustav, uh, yeah, once you set up, I'll take one question. 